Lesia, thanks for joining me today. Um, so we're going to talk about Heineken USA. Now this is a company that has a portfolio of brands including Amstel and Newcastle and obviously Heineken. Mm -hmm. um, you've been in your role now for a couple years? Is Almost that right? two years, yeah, about a year and a half. Okay, so when you came on board, and you've got a background that includes time at Kraft, for example, and other um, consumer packaged goods companies, yeah. you know, what did you feel was your first order of business at Heineken? Yeah, that's an easy question to answer because the Heineken brand had been declining for five years before I joined. Mm -hmm. um, we had changed campaigns, we had changed agencies, um, and we just had, we had been declining for five years. So the first order of business, and it really has been my primary focus for the year and a half that I've been there, is to turn the business around. Okay, and what did you attribute the decline to? You said changing agencies and a lot of things, but I mean, was there just like a lack of focus on the specific brand? Heineken and yeah. its brand story that you wanted to tell? I think we had just really lost our way in many ways and it wasn't just from a marketing standpoint um, and in general the whole business is, is really making a turnaround over the last two years but from a marketing standpoint I think it was just a lot of change so we'd have a campaign then we change the campaign change it again and the consumer really just kind of lost the way of you know for what what the Heineken brand stands for and I think we talked to consumers, you know, at the beginning of my tenure, they would just say that it's a, it's a little bit outdated and they didn't really know what the brand stood sure, for. Sure, sure. And you're operating in a com completely competitive market. I mean, beer sales overall have been lagging in recent years with the competition from spirits brands and, I mean, yeah. the, the noise and the competitiveness of the um, smaller craft brews, for example. So not only were you struggling but then you were dealing in such a competitive place let's talk a little bit about what's been changing in the market in general because i know latest figures show that beer sales are actually on an uptick can you yeah. talk a little bit about that yeah well actually imports and crafts are are driving the category in general mm -hmm. but um you know as a broad statement it's uh you know the category has these huge spend competitors mm -hmm. um i think the highest spend of actually any brands out there and um and with all the competition happening and a relatively slow growth category, um, it's just an incredibly competitive competitive category overall. So, yeah. And what's happening as far as consumer preferences? What are you feeling are the key insights that you're paying attention to? Yeah. So the category is moving from a loyalty category to a repertoire category. So, you know, uh, the, the, the guy who used to drink uh, a Bud Light would drink it when he was 21 and drink it when he was 41 and drink it at a bar and drink it at home. And over the last, I'd say, four or five years, very recently, the category has moved to be a repertoire category. So um, craft drinkers on average try 46 brands in a year. Um, and the average consumer has moved to a repertoire of between seven and 10 brands. Mm. So depending on if they're out versus if they're home versus, you know, um, are they in a sort of a higher energy occasion or lower energy occasion, they're actually switching their brands around. So the noise in the category has just gotten a lot higher. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you put all the consumer dynamics that are happening just with um, you know, our guy, so our, our, our consumer is the guy who is at the forefront of all the digital social changes that are happening. So on average, our guy, 75% of our guys, when they're watching TV, always have a device with them. Interesting. So there are sort of two big things that are happening in the category. And I want to get back to the digital component and sort of the, the, the media strategy that you use. Yeah. Um, as far as reaching new targets, I mean, to what extent are you reaching out to women or multicultural uh, millennials? I mean, these are obviously key markets as well. So, yeah. you know, what are you doing in that area as well? Yeah. So um, the Heineken brand actually is very well positioned to the sort of to the to the ethnic groups out there. Mm -hmm. So um, our African American and Hispanic consumers represent 50 percent of our consumer base. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at our strategies and our communication, our, our executions, our advertising, the Hispanic consumer actually, even more than general market consumer, really responds to that advertising. So we over-index mm -hmm. and that consumer is really responding. So from a Heineken standpoint, I think we're really well positioned uh, with all the, you know, the changes that are happening with the consumer base out there. So now let's talk about the media strategy, because I know you do a lot of things in digital. You're celebrating your 140 year anniversary um, in 2013. Yeah. And right now you have an interactive kind of a crowdsourcing, design your own, your bottle of the future. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you're leveraging digital and social media 
to yeah. really get your brand um, story in front of yeah. all of your targets. So, um, as I said, it's a big spend category. A lot of cons a lot of brands spending a lot of money, but actually in a very traditional way. Yeah. So the typical thing is a 30 second spot on ESPN and a relatively linear storyline, guys with guys, guys with a dog, guys in a <laughs> bar. Um, and we are a relatively small player in that, in that world. So we're a four, Heineken USA in total has 4% share. So we're actually relatively small. Um, and our strategy, which we've deployed and we're deploying quite successfully, is to really zig where the competition is zagging. So what we do is, if you look at a Heineken spot, it's you know, a, very, a very different kind of a spot. You know, it's kind of a layered communication. It's something that you see the first time and you really didn't get the whole, mm -hmm. you know, all the nuances and um, you really want to see it again. So the strategy that we've deployed is that we actually go on TV with a 90 second spot first, which is very unusual. I mean, I don't even actually know any other brands other, even outside of you know, our category. Starts with a 90, then we go with a 60, and then we go to a 30. Hmm. And the whole strategy is that we really want the consumer to get engaged in the more traditional medium and then take, you know, take that Follow engagement yeah, yeah. into online. And it really is working. So um, you know, we have, we have the number one Twitter mentions in the U.S. We have the number one Facebook fans uh, globally. Um, you know, we're we're just in general. We really are deploying our efforts and our and our spend that way. Mm -hmm. And the thing really has to work holistically, which is which is how we're trying to do it. Um, and it, it really seems to be working. So, so talk now a little bit about what you're doing with the other brands in the Heineken portfolio, for example, Newcastle and Dos Equis. How are you applying the same strategies to those brands? Yeah. So. Um, if you think about the kind of engaging the consumer in a different way than most other brands are doing it, um, you know, when you have a spokesperson for Dos Equis who is in his 60s, that is a very unusual, <laughs> unusual thing to do, particularly when he says, I don't always drink beer. This is, a, you know, this is really uh, different for the category. So, you know, I know when we first came out with that, the, the campaign, it That's was... That's an example of zigging when everybody yeah, else is zagging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it really is different. Now it seems so normal, but... Um, you know, it's just, uh, if, if that's not sort of doing something differently, I, you know, that's, that's, I think, a great example of that. So, and Dos Equis just continues to be on fire. It has grown by 20 plus percent for the last five years. And it just shows no signs of slowing down. It's just a fantastic brand, fantastic consumer engagement. So, so that's an example for Dos Equis. And then um, Newcastle, actually, we just uh, started with a new campaign this year. The tagline is uh, no bollocks. And so Newcastle stands for uh, being refreshingly honest in a restrained world. And uh, our biggest success actually has been in the social and digital um, uh, medium. So if um, you go onto our Facebook page, um, we, we deploy a lot of, we have a lot of sort of um, really funny uh, stuff that we put on the Facebook page regarding the no bollocks kind of point of view To build of that of personality life. Yeah. around the brand. Yeah, yeah. and uh, one of the big, the big things that we track is the Facebook, you know, they have now a talked about score. So how many people are talking about or doing anything, t any active, the way they measure it is they, taking any active, uh, active response or action. Yeah, when yeah. they go on your page other than just uh, viewing it. And what they've told us is that a really good score is 5%, and a Newcastle is 25%. What do you attribute so, that to? Well, they, you know, what they've said is, because we said, you know, why, why do you think it's working so well? And they said it's because um, it's very funny and it's very bite-sized. So a consumer can easily take, you know, take something that's on there and put it onto their news feed, and that's really what, what consumers are doing. So, you know, we post we have all sorts of posts, but we'll get like 15,000 likes for one post. Mm. So they're now holding us up as actually outside of the beer category as one of the best brands out there doing it. So um, we feel good about that because that's really where our consumer is living and, uh, and we're having some fun with it too. Let's talk about Skyfall because this is a, a recent example of an um, exclusive um, product placement arrangement that you yeah. had. You were the exclusive beer um, that was included yes. in, in the movie, and you also yeah. had, leading up to it, uh, TV spots that mm -hmm. featured Daniel Craig yeah. and featured the beer. Um, talk about how that fits into your overall strategy yeah. and what the results of that were. Yeah, so for us, James Bond in the U.S. was a perfect marriage of the man of the world into American consumers. He's just the ultimate man of the world. So a familiar, sort of a familiar, uh, you know, um, character 
who really is seen as aspiration in the, aspirational in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we really, you know, took advantage, full advantage of that. So not only was their product placement in the an amazing movie, I mean, it was just a fantastic movie, mm -hmm. but also Daniel Craig appeared in our TV spot. Um, and we, though, it really fit within the structure of the kind of spots that we're doing. So again, we did the 90, the 60, and the 30. So it really followed the same strategy that we've been deploying. And then we really also tried to take it to every, as many touch points as possible. Mm -hmm. So we had an on-premise um, game that we did that was a digital game. And then we also did a big retail promotion. So uh, we, you know, we had free tickets in the, in the cases. And so it really allowed our sales force to take that property and do a lot at retail. So it was actually the perfect combination. And um, the latest results are the last two periods in uh, September and October, we had the highest share that we've had in five years. Excellent. So, you know, um, yeah, some good results there. So. so where do you go from here? What, you know, what can we expect to see from Heineken and really where would you like to see the brand? Um, well, what we're doing is working and um, we're gonna do more of the same. I mean, that is sort of the, the short answer. Um, and I think the more we can take the global assets that we have, because everything we do now is global, and really kind of provide a top spin in the U.S., that's what we're going to continue to do. So we're going to continue with the strategy that we're, that we're deploying and really try to find ways to, you know, to, bring, to bring either a local spin to it or um, something that really kind of um, you know, uh, personalizes it for the U.S., which we've been doing and doing successfully. So it's really more of the same. <laughs> As a brand, what do you want people to, to, to equate the Heineken brand with? So the Heineken brand um, uh, is progressive, it's open-minded, um, and the Heineken consumer is the guy who can navigate any social situation and really is um, you know, the guy who, who can go into any circumstance and be comfortable. And that's what Heineken is all about.